So I am Andre Marquis. I'm the executive director of the Lester Center for Entrepreneurship uh, in the Haas School of Business um, and a proud Haas MBA 1996. Go Bears! Thank you all for coming for our first um, and, of course, most august uh, Entrepreneurs Forum of the year. I always find this one tremendously exciting. I mean, we are in a tremendous time for startups and for venture capital, and you are not only going to hear about the tremendous uh, excitement and, and growth going on um, from really the guy who knows all of the numbers. There is literally no more. Um, you got to go to the Fenwick website, or the PricewaterhouseCoopers. Yeah, the Fenwick website. They've got this report. If you don't pick up one of these books, which I highly recommend you do, they're outside. They have a bunch of these online as well. And um, you should absolutely 100% um, get a copy of this. It's, it's a great understanding of how different things are growing. For those of you who weren't here earlier for our orientation session, if you want to learn about everything entrepreneurship coming out of the business school, go to entrepreneurship.berkeley.edu and get on our mailing list. You can sign up right on our homepage. All our announcements, all our mentoring hours, all our events, all our hackathons, all of our competitions, global social venture competition, launch competition, everything, all the announcements come out there. Um, if you're interested in the Engineering School Entrepreneurship Center, that's cet.berkeley.edu, Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. And if you're interested in our Skydeck Accelerator, skydeck.berkeley.edu. Um, there's a Citrus Foundry, there's a QB3 Accelerator, there's so many centers of entrepreneurship around this campus, and that is what makes this campus great. Um, we can't you know, do it all at the Lester Center, and we have great partners around campus, so I highly encourage you to go to all those um, websites. So we have a tradition here um, at the Entrepreneurs Forum where we have uh, an entrepreneur stand up and tell you a little bit about uh, her business and ask you for something. So is uh, Donna here? Donna, come on down. Donna Friedman Mayer from Wow Experiences. Hi there, um, my name is Donna Friedman Mayer and I am a longtime kids media executive slash entrepreneur. Worked at places like Nickelodeon, Warner Brothers, National Geographic, and I am now a budding entrepreneur um, developing a concept called Wowtopia that's basically a grab-on, hands-on, touring global cultural festival for kids and families. So think Adventure Park meets Maker Fair meets Cultural Festival, all delivered in a Cirque du Soleil style touring model. Um, so I am looking for somebody who is passionate about kids and families and play and culture and bringing the world to life um, in a way that will really inspire kids to respect, appreciate, and understand this amazing world that we live in. Um, looking for everything from project work, you know, um, to a true co-founder, somebody who has uh, entrepreneurship experience, business, financial background. That's what I'm looking for. So if you're interested, contact me at Donna at wowexplorations.com. Excellent. Thank you, Donna. That was Donna at wowexplorations.com. Is that right? Excellent. Um, well, now I would like to introduce our moderator for this evening. Um, uh, we've had a long, long relationship. I think this is the seventh year um, that uh, Sam and um, Sam Angus and Fenwick have sponsored this event. Um, all that lovely food and drink you had outside was sponsored by Fenwick. So thank you very much to Fenwick. Um, I mean, Sam, uh, he comes for our mentoring hours. He's an attorney um, and his practice is in advising startups and venture-backed companies. He's done everything from startups to privately held companies to public companies. You look at who he's been counsel for, people like Cosmics, uh, Naxion Corporation, which is Wine Shopper, Ingenio, it was required by AT&T, Jungly, multi-hundred million dollar acquisition. Uh, he's a guy with a huge amount of startup experience, um, a guy you should know. Um, hopefully he'll stick around a little bit uh, afterwards to ask Sam some questions. But with, with that, uh, thank you again, Sam, and thank you, Fenwick, for sponsoring this event. Come on up, sir. Thank you. 
Is this working? I guess it is. Um, so today's panel is, as usual, we have an annual event, a tradition here, where we review sort of the state of angel and venture capital investing over the past year and looking forward. And it's, it's really quite an opportune time to do this. Um, last year, we thought was um, things were going well and, and quite active. And this year, they're, 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 I think, things seem to be doubling down. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the program that we've done in the past, and we're not going to deviate from what we've done before. The first part of this is going to be Steve Benston, partner at PwC, uh, who will be doing the Money Tree presentation for Q2 2015, and he'll run through the numbers. And then after that, the panelists will come up, and we will um, we'll run through a, ver a set of uh, hopefully provocative uh, questions and answers, and then we'll have some time afterwards where um, we'll have some uh, Q&A sessions. So without further ado, I'd like to call up Steve Bankston, and with his, uh, his wit and his intelligence, he'll, he'll keep us entertained. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so we're going to talk about trends in the venture business. Uh, you've got uh, this in your presentation, so you can uh, read along and uh, capture the information. But we've been doing this a long time, and there's 100 times the amount of data we're going to talk about here you can see on these two websites uh, on the bottom. Um, but the, uh, if you just, just the last few years, if you look at uh, venture capital funding, uh, this gives you an idea. Just in the US, the last four or five years, you can see it was pretty steady state through about 13, and then uh, California, I'm sorry, uh, Colorado and Washington legalized marijuana and things uh, <laughs> really went up uh, last year and that trend has continued uh, this year. Uh, in fact, if you look at a historical perspective, you know, the last 10 years have been pretty much 20 to 30 billion of venture funding in the US and then last year uh, uh, skyrocketed to 50 billion, third biggest year ever. And you can see the first half of this year we're at 31. So we're going to be somewhere 50 to 60 billion uh, this year unless uh, the sky falls. So this could easily be the second biggest year ever in U.S. venture funding. And uh, you know, most of us think that you know, the 50 billion, the 100 billion back 10 years ago led to a lot of bad things. So you know, we'll see if this is a, uh, a different outcome uh, this time. Uh, there's a reason we're doing this uh, presentation in, in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, broadly defined, because that's where all the money is. Um, you, you can see uh, the dominance of Silicon Valley. It's about half uh, the market. Uh, in fact, there's really four markets that matter, uh, New York, uh, uh, here, Southern California, and uh, Boston. Um, the other three all have about 10%. We have about 50, so about 80% of the market's in four cities uh, in the US. How many of you are from a different part of the US, not the Bay Area? So you know, I, I, I come from the Northwest, and, and uh, we, had some, we have something called the Silicon Forest. Uh, and you know, there's a whole bunch of silicon fill in the blanks around the US. So you'd think, with all those people trying to mimic Silicon Valley, they would slowly chip away at the market share of, of Silicon Valley. And that would sound good in theory, but uh, you know, wouldn't be true. You can see this is the market share of Silicon Valley venture since we started the money tree in 95, and you can see it's slowly inched up and really skyrocketed the last couple years. So now it's about 50% of the market, which is counterintuitive, but good for everyone in this room. There's a lot of money in the Bay Area. Uh, in fact, this slide tracks the amount of money invested by VCs just in Silicon Valley by quarter uh, the last uh, number of years. And kind of one scary number is Q2 of this year was the biggest year, biggest quarter ever in Silicon Valley, bigger than any quarter during these so-called bubble years. Uh, so we'll see if that's a, a harbinger of things to come. But in any case, there's a lot of money sloshing around Silicon Valley every quarter right now. Uh, this is the same data, but just look at the number of deals. So you can see it's not nearly the number of deals uh, that were going on back in uh, the late 90s and 2000. But some of the deals are just much, much bigger, which is why the money is so big. And then if you just look at seri uh, Series A, it gives you a, a good proxy for companies getting started. Again, a lot of money. There's about a billion dollars being invested each quarter in Silicon Valley right now just in Series A. So let that sink in for a second. A billion dollars in Series A. The typical funding is about $5 million. So that's a lot of experiments going on in Silicon Valley. Uh, in fact, this is the same data, just the number. So it's just 100 startups uh, uh, going on uh, each quarter, but they're getting a billion dollars in total. Um, 
And yet the, the money flows at almost every round. I mean, you're all familiar with Series A, Series B, Series C, you'd expect that. But for some reason, Series I was really popular uh, in, in Q2 of this year. Uh, and I think Sam is, uh, has most to do that, because I think most of that comes from Airbnb, which is uh, one of his uh, main clients. And, and uh, they only wanted 500 million, but Sam talked him into a billion five. Uh, and so, it, so it's kind of weird that the, you know, the most amount of money uh, goes into Series I, but there you are. And in fact, there was quite a bit of money going into Series Q, if you can believe that. Now, how, raise your hand if you've been involved with a Series Q ever in your life. Now, I've been asking, no one ever admits to this. These, these are the, okay, Sam, first film, finally, a lone soldier, brave person. Now here's one of Sam's favorite slides because basically all the companies are, are uh, within a, a close Uber ride from his office now. You know, San Francisco has taken over the epicenter of Silicon Valley. Um, uh, many quarters, there's more Series A deals done in San Francisco than every other city combined in the Bay Area, which is a kind of a startling stat for any of us who have been around for more than about three years. Um, and uh, so the one, one big question for the, uh, for the uh, the audience and the panel is, you know, is, it, is this going to lead to the epicenter of all of Silicon Valley being in San Francisco? Right now, you'd have to still say the epicenter of, you know, the, the major kind of huge companies is still somewhere around Palo Alto, Sunnyvale, Santa Clara. Um, but if, if all the Series A is happening in San Francisco, are, are they going to grow up into the unicorns and take over the epicenter? Or when they grow up and, and uh, have to do crazy things like buy a house, you know, raise a family, are they going to migrate back to the suburbs? So I think the jury's out on that. Uh, these are just the top 10 deals uh, just in Q2 uh, in the Bay Area. You can see San Francisco has just completely taken over um, uh, the, the, the dominance of the big deals going on. You know, eight of the top 10 deals uh, were uh, in San Francisco. And finally, one of the top 10 deals was in Berkeley. So give, you, give yourself a hand. Now we're going to rag on Berkeley a little later in the presentation, so enjoy, and so enjoy this one. Um, but uh, and one was in South San Francisco, but none of the top ten deals were south of South San Francisco. I mean that's pretty amazing uh, for this area. Um, you know, Mark Andreessen's line about software slowly eating the world is is happening. You can see in this chart, this is all the, the top investments by industry, and you know really all of these sectors except biotech rely on software for, for the core of their businesses. Um, and so, you know, software really is becoming the dominant force uh, in almost all of the investments uh, around the country. Uh, this contrasts the, the median uh, standard of investment. Well, you see it really hasn't changed in the last few years versus the mean, which really skyrocketed the last few years with these billion dollar investments. So you're getting, a, you know, three or four super large deals with, which distort the mean. But the median really hasn't changed much. You know, it's in the three to four million round quarter after quarter. Uh, this tracks uh, the most active investors just defined by number of deals they're doing. And, you know, most of these are well-known firms and most of them uh, are ba based in the Bay Area. And the ones that aren't certainly do deals in the Bay Area. But you see there's just a lot of deals. This is just one quarter, which is, you know, 10 to 12 weeks. And, you know, everyone's doing roughly a deal a week or more. A lot of numbers on this chart, but just a couple messages. One, you know, M&A is actually down a little bit, which is counterintuitive with all these companies getting funded at high valuations. But one of the things we're hearing in the market is the private valuations are so high. There's, there's a so-called private bubble without a public bubble. So the valuations of these private companies are getting so high, it's causing consternation by some of the public acquirers who normally would have a, a big appetite uh, to swallow these things up. Uh, by contrast, the IPO market has been pretty healthy the last uh, several years, at least by uh, the standards of the last 15 years. You can see it's, it's probably going to be a little lower this year than, uh, than last year, but last year was the biggest year we've had probably in 15 years, at least in terms of the number of IPOs, and we're still headed toward you know, 70 or 80 uh, this year, which would be one of the top two or three years of the last decade. As you'd expect, venture fundraising has uh, rebounded. You can see in the last few years, you know, venture capitalists in the aggregate raised about 15 billion a year, but then last year raised about 30 billion, and this year uh, 17 through the first half, so they're gonna be on track for another 30 billion or so uh, in the US. Uh, this looks at the top 10 deals in the whole US. We saw Silicon Valley earlier, and you can see how San Francisco dominated. And this, this is mainly, you know, where you see that, uh, whatever this is, I think six 
of the top 10 deals in the whole US or in Silicon Valley. And this is very different from what we would have seen 10 years ago. You know, the, va the, the value used to be much more about capital efficiency, doing more with less, getting, you know, building great companies on not much cash. You don't hear that phrase very much anymore. Um, uh, and, uh, and in fact, we're seeing you know, massive investment in Silicon Valley in these later stage firms. And uh, now they tend to dominate these lists of most investment uh, in a deal around the US. So in summary, um, there's a lot of good news and a lot of bad news uh, uh, circulating around. But these days, more good news. Um, you can read these uh, faster than me, but I'll just point out a couple of things. One, if you look at venture capital globally around the world, about a third of venture capital gets invested just in California. About another third somewhere else in the US, and, about, and the final third somewhere else in the world. So the good news is two-thirds of the venture capital that's getting invested in the world is still being invested in the US, uh, which helps explain why we still dominate high-tech investing, high exits, you know, top public companies, et cetera. Um, uh, secondly, you know, the advertising has become a, a very big part, particularly of co consumer internet companies. And you can see there's some distortion here by the time we spend on these various media versus the amount of money going into this. Normally, those numbers should be about the same. You can see uh, media, gets uh, in print, gets way more of the money than it does of eyeballs. So it's a safe, safe bet over the next 10 years, a lot of money is gonna come out of print uh, and go somewhere else. In fact, you can see radio's in pretty much equilibrium as is TV, as is internet, but mobile is also out. Uh, so it's a good prediction that mobile is gonna get a lot more media money over the next 10 years because they're getting almost a quarter of our media time, but they're getting very little of the media money. And yet there's some bad news. I mean, you can read all these, although um, for at least Sam, you know, the patent litigation is good news. Uh, in fact, I think Sam filed most of those uh, uh, pat you know, patent lawsuits against AT&T, which is why he can keep funding this event. Um, but, uh, you know, China, which has been a major uh, you know, factor in uh, venture and in the global economy, you know, is now a little more uncertain. You know, the growth rates have really uh, gone down. There's all kinds of gyrations going on in the stock market. You know, China is, for the first time in a long time, a very uncertain place uh, to be doing business. And the global public tech valuations uh, have really uh, uh, been uh, dropped uh, in the last uh, year or two, uh, which in theory should cause a compression in the private markets. Um, a lot of things going on in the venture world is too. I'll just uh, touch on the highlights. I mean, the gap between the, the haves and the have-nots, or so-called, has really grown. You know, right now there's maybe 30, 40 funds that can raise as much as they want, typically raise 200, 300 plus in each fund. But the vast majority of, of VC firms are raising 10 million, 15, 20 million. So you've got a bunch of small firms that really focus on the early stage at some level, working with, cooperating with, but competing with the, the larger funds that have almost unlimited money. So it's a very different market than it was uh, 10 years ago. Um, and the IPO market's really changed. Uh, uh, 10 years ago, the firms were way less mature, way less revenue. You can see now it's taking seven years versus three years to go public, et cetera. And finally, a prominent VC a couple years ago claimed that 97% of the venture profits, however you want to define that, come from about 15 companies annually. So you can argue whether that should be 15 or 20 or 30 or 50, but it's, I think we'd all agree it's a relatively small number that create the big exits, either from M&A or IPO. And so one of the questions that you know, you know, persists in the venture industry, if there's only 50 companies that really matter every year, how many VCs do you need to find them and fund them? You know, right now that's about 2,000. Um, and so you know, there's, there's a lot of money chasing very few really, really good deals. Uh, globalization continues to be a big deal. You can read most of these. Um, I'll just touch on a few points. There's 120 unicorns in the private market right now around the world. 120 companies have a billion dollar market cap that are still private. So let that sink in uh, for a while. Um, uh, and, and you can just see you know, China and India get most of the press. In fact, China just took over the number one economy last year. But in the next five years, India will probably have more people may have a larger uh, uh, domestic economy, might have the largest economy in the world, and so all the press that really focuses on China now is probably gonna migrate to India over the next five years or so. And with that, we'll bring Sam up uh, in the panel. Thanks. Excellent, excellent. Well, I'll invite the uh, panelists up, uh, and I will, um, let me introduce them briefly and then ask that they give maybe a one minute 
overview about uh, who they are, what their focus is. Um, and do you guys, do you guys have a, is this the mic they should use, Andre? Is this the mic they should use? Yeah. I'm going to have to share that. Um, so um, closest to me is Trip Jones. He's a partner at August Capital. Um, and next to him is Abe Yokel. He is a partner at Rockport Capital Partners. And then Rob, awesome, you made it. Um, Rob Coney Bear at, is a managing director at Shasta Ventures. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, Trip, why don't you give us a little overview of, of who you are and what you're, what you're focused on. Sure. Uh, I'm Trip Jones. I'm a general partner at August Capital. Uh, we're uh, the fund that's just next to Rob's fund uh, on Sand Hill Road. Um, we uh, just raised August 7, which is a $450 million uh, early stage venture capital fund. Uh, I was brought on about you know four to five years ago to help August build out a later stage effort. Um, over the last three or four years, we decided that we're not going to invest in later stage deals because of the increase in valuation. So I spend most of my time looking at internet-enabled network businesses uh, and software businesses, kind of in the Series A and Series B uh, time frame. Um, I've been doing it for I've been an investor for about nine years um, and have made you know ten or ten to twelve investments while I've been at August. Thanks, Abe. Great. Abe Yokel, I'm a partner at Rockport Capital Partners. Uh, we're a fund focused on energy, sustainability, and mobility, broadly defined. Uh, been around for about 15 years, about $850 million under assets, uh, under management, three separate funds, um, offices in Boston and, and San Francisco. I moved out from Boston about eight years ago to help us open up the California efforts. I've been with the firm for about uh, 12 years now, and uh, we are stage agnostic. We don't do a lot of seed, but we will, we will do Series A, and uh, we pretend to do uh, uh, what is called late stage investing, but we don't really compare to what's going on in the market. So we're probably more defined as kind of an ABC investor these days. Can, can people hear this microphone? Mike, yeah? yeah? All right, we're on target. Uh, I'm Rob Connybeer. I'm with Shasta Ventures. I've been in venture capital for, I can't believe I'm about to say this, 19 years. Eight years at New Enterprise Associates, left to co-found Shasta with a couple other people about 10 years ago. We're currently investing out of our fourth fund, which is a $300 million fund. And we invest in Series A, traditional Series A, first institutional round. We do some seed investing, some later stage investing. About half in enterprise, half in consumer. And probably the best known companies we've backed so far are uh, Series A investment in Nest Labs, which was acquired by Google a couple of years ago, Nextdoor, that people may have heard of. And on the enterprise side, companies like Anaplan, Lithium, which is based here in East Bay, and uh, many others. Oh, fantastic. Um, so a question that comes up whenever I'm at one of these networking events or even talking to, to entrepreneurs who come into my office is, you know, so wh what is going on in the market right now? 2015 so far has been just a, a banner year, as Steve, um, as St Steve described. Um, I, I just can't believe the one statistic you gave that Q2 was the largest, the, the, the largest in terms of dollars of VC funding ever. Um, sort of a sobering thought. And you know, from from my perspective as a service provider, business has never been better. There are more companies being formed. Money is is extremely, you know, relatively easy to get, and so in, in, in from each of your perspectives, be very interested to hear what what are you seeing. Don't all jump at once. Well, I think I think <laughs> fundamentally, I mean, there's a couple things. One is the public markets are completely different than what they were in the last boom. That always has that spike that you see in those numbers. So, Sam, one of your the companies you're involved with was responsible for what a billion five yeah. of that yeah. alone. Yeah. And that's a company that, without question, in the last boom, would have gone public long right. ago, and that would have been a secondary offering or something like that. So, I think Steve might want to update those numbers in some manner to really show like that difference. I know you try with the, the A, but the reason I mention this is you see so many companies staying private so much longer that that's, that's one of the things that's happening. I think number two, having done this for a while, and these guys have done it for a while as well, is the numbers that you see for the change in mobile only tell half the story because in 99 and 2000, when you had the huge dollars going in, you only had 20 million 
broadband connections worldwide. And those 20 million broadband connections, none of them were wireless. They were all connected to computers that you had to boot up and you had to wait five minutes, 10 minutes from the startup. And payment systems weren't there. All the infrastructure wasn't in place. And now you have not just 5 billion phone users, but you have 2 billion smartphone users. You have 2 billion people around the world that can turn on a phone and in a moment, they're playing with live ammunition. They can spend money on things, on stuff. And that's a completely different environment than you had before. And that's the backdrop against which all these companies are growing so explosively right now. So I think you really have to remember that the fundamental infrastructure has, has changed over the last 10 years. I, I totally agree with, with Rob's point there. And, I, and I'd say like that's the vast majority of the trend that we're seeing. Um, you know, there's some, some strong macros and there, you know, there's just a lot of capital sloshing around as well. Uh, that being said, you know, as, as the, you know, the 30 or 40, um, you know, kind of sandhill firms that can kind of raise money and keep raising larger and larger funds go on. It's partly also, some of this is a little bit of our fault because, you know, we, uh, we, you know, we, we have the, you know, as series A and B investors, we have these ownership thresholds. And as we keep on raising larger and larger funds, we, you know, where, uh, a normal Series A was used to be five million dollars, which we were just joking about. It's now like seven, and then it kind of goes to twelve this year, and that kind of and we're playing a plain venture math where we're trying to own twenty to twenty five percent of a, a business when we do a Series A, and you can kind of you can you can do the math there. So you know all of a sudden a post money valuations fifty instead of twenty five, and so there's a lot more you know you know beyond the the, the large check sizes that you know entrepreneurs now have. $12 million in their pocket, not four. And you know, they're spending it. Um, and so it's something to be cognizant of. That won't, that won't last forever. Yeah, I, I would agree with both of those comments. I think the, the global view in my mind is, is even a little bit more nuanced, which is all of those tech trends exist, but what's happened globally is that the entire world has recognized that technology is vitally important in everything they do in the world. And that the, the underlying trend is, is this mobile propagation uh, in general and, and internet penetration. But what's happened in general is that um, every country in, in the world has looked towards technology and the technology hub is Silicon Valley. And all of a sudden LPs that fund funds like ours are very interested in, in, in beachheads in Silicon Valley. Many of whom are either funding venture funds or many of whom are now actually funding some of these late stage rounds that are bumping some of the big numbers in the, in the back half of that. Um, so I think there's been a greater importance and emphasis on technology in every aspect of the world. Um, and that's been recognized and that's, that's dictating some of the capital flow. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like some of the promises from the last bubble when, when money was being thrown at companies um, without regard to their business model or whether they were profitable. I remember Webvan, you remember that company and, 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 and others, um, where the mantra was just let's just get users because this is, this is just a paradigm shift. Technology is gonna, is gonna rule the world. Now it seems like that, that is maybe coming true with the platform built out with companies extremely capital efficient um, is it is it coming true, or or is it? Yeah, are there's we... absolutely no businesses out there with upside down unit economics. Just none. <laughs> they're, you know, they're all super profitable from the very beginning. <laughs> but my, my my question is, is it coming true, or are we, as as some VCs are are warning, at the edge of a preposit, at the edge of a cliff, and about to go over the cliff? Have has it got has valuations gotten so out of whack? Is capital being thrown at these companies so freely and un, in an undisciplined way? that it's buyer beware? I mean, the answer is yes, you know, to, bo to both answers. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to be, you know, it's tough to, you, it, it, you know, all these answers have to be more nuanced than, than, than you know, some, some kind of, you know, one-liner. But we, you know, we are, because there always are gonna be great companies that always are gonna get appropriately funded and they're gonna be, you know, I don't know if the next Google or Facebook was formed this year, but maybe, you know, and, right. and, the, and that's always the possibility. That being said, um, we are, in our industry, are probably too enamored by, you know, massive scalability and, especially on the consumer side, mm -hmm. things are scaling super, super, super quickly and product experiences that are magical. Mm -hmm. And we think that when we see, you know, a thousand percent growth and a magical product experience, 
uh, we're like all in on those. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we, we don't realize, and probably until it's going to be too late, that the reason why the experience is magical because someone is bringing me something for free. And it, it's magical because it's too good to be true, and you know, too good to be true never lasts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but Cosmo was great while it was around. Oh, so, oh you guys I mean, may not remember Cosmo. I mean, but use wow, Instacart as much as you possibly can. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's Every funny week. because Cosmos is like a lot is like a lot of the business models today, and especially in the food space, right? I mean, delivery. So. Yeah. Well, it's it, it's interesting. I mean, you look at it a couple of ways. When when I serve on a panel like this, I always find it interesting because it, a lot of these things are unknowable, and as an investor. I spend time trying to figure out things that I actually know, mm-hmm. and that means going to categories that aren't crowded right now. So I think that when entrepreneurs in this room are thinking about where should I go, hey, can I come up with a better idea for a messaging app, or can I come up with a better food delivery service, or can I do that type of thing? Maybe, but your time is probably better set, spent looking at areas where there's not a lot of competition right now. And I think that when you look at what's going on, the reason that you find kind of the the conflict in what people are saying is because there are gonna be a lot of things that fail there, but the things that are really interesting are gonna be in the areas that feel like they're on the fringe right now. Those are going to be the future kind of areas where people are wondering like, is it going to be overfunded or not? You wanna be early in one of those markets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Tripp's underlying point uh, before that he made on how venture math works, and this was this showed up in the 15 deals, you know, provide returns. I feel like the the capital flow into the sector in general has just multiplied this effect. So now, where that used to be done at seed and Series A, where you take a portfolio approach, it's now kind of happening in the later stage deals as well with with big capital flows. So I think there will be winners. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's going to be some losers at those late stages as well, and I can't predict which they are. So you know. I hate to say this in a panel, but I don't have a clue what's going to happen in the macro environment. Like, not even a slight clue. Um, there's so many incredible trends at the fundamental level that, that are incredibly robust and are really exciting. Um, and there is good reason to think that there's a lot of value that's going to be created in the ecosystem broadly defined over time. But I don't know where it's going to come from. One other quick comment that I, I made to somebody before the panel. I was, I was chatting with one of our LPs about four years ago. Um, and she, they represent a, a lot of, of, uh, of various constituents. And uh, I asked her what the most out of favor sector was uh, at the time, this was in 2011. And she told me that biotech was. Um, four years later, it's probably one of, one of the best returning areas in all of venture. To, and that's to Rob's point, which is you know, stick with what you know and what gets you excited. And if it's a messaging app, find something else. <laughs> Um, well put. Uh, another development in sort of the, the, the funding ecosystem is the emergence of sort of a professionalized seed class with a, a, a huge amount of volume. And that, that's just not angel investors or sort of these seed, these seed VC funds, but also crowdfunding platforms and incubators. And so there's a lot of noise happening at the seed level how has that impacted the way you guys, as VC partners, see deals and do deals? Well, I, I think that one of the things that has always happened in venture capital is you've always had new entrants mm-hmm. of different flavors. So that's always happened. And whether it was in the early days of venture capital where you had a lot of people banding together and doing syndicated deals where everybody would put in like a million bucks a piece to get to a $5 million round. Mm -hmm. This is just part of a natural evolution. So you have new entrants that are coming along and they're taking advantage of the way that it's changed and the way the economics have changed to start businesses. But it's just a natural evolution. What, What you find over and over again is you have some of the leading angel firms are now becoming institutionalized firms. They're raising more money, they have money under management. And without naming names, some people that focused on the the first round in companies, Mm -hmm. um, later on they're like, yeah, we have ownership targets we need to hit, and yeah, we're gonna be doing our full pro rata in this round, or 
knocking on the door of companies that were way outside of their zone before. So I think what happens is you have this, <coughs> this natural entrant when you talk about a lot of the incubators and angels. Mm -hmm. I think when you take a look at crowdfunding, crowdfunding to a certain extent has been a mixed bag. That's, that's been the reality because people at first when they saw some of the crowdfunding campaigns come along for hardware that raised like $8 million or $10 million, people were like, product market fit, this is great. But really all it was was concept market fit. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it's a good idea, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. But then when people got them and they touched them and, and started to use them, it wasn't so great and they had telegraphed all their plans to everybody. So. I love the experimentation. I love entrepreneurs' access to capital. But at the same time, these, a lot of these things are, are experiments. And it's just part of the natural evolution that you have in any capital formation market. But I'll, yeah, go, go ahead, Trip. Oh, I, I was going to say, and, and for, you know, whether it's fair or not, there's a perception on the crowdfunding that there's a negative selection bias, too. That you know you couldn't go to a traditional you know fund structure and, and get funded, so you had to you know go on angel list. I don't know you know time will tell whether or not that's a, you know true, but that's the perception. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know one of the other things I wanted to talk about is how you guys find deals. You know, um, where do you get most of your leads? Is it do you? Are you knowledgeable in a given area and you uncover? Is it going to conferences? Is it, is it inbound interest? Is it through referrals? And, and how has that changed over the years? Well, it, it, it comes from everywhere. I think when you're, when you're an investor, you, 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 you have these uncomfortable moments <clears throat> the first few years you're a venture capitalist where everybody starts pitching you ideas and you go to you know, back to school night and your kids are in school and like a few parents come up and like, hey, I have this startup I wanna to talk to you about. And then you get used to it, you're like, oh, you know, it's fine. So my, my point here is Try that, being a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you really, <laughs> but it, 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 starts, it starts to come from all these places. It's, it's relationships, people you get to know over time. It's entrepreneurs you've worked with before. It's attorneys, it's all these places. Typically, if you're thinking in this room about how do you want to get introduced or get found, maybe that, that would be the question. The best thing to do is to get a warm introduction from somebody that's well-connected and well-regarded to that person. They can put in a good word on your behalf. That's by far the types of introductions that we get mm -hmm. really excited about. Mm -hmm. That said, the most recent deal that I, I signed uh, yesterday yeah. is you guys will love this. It's, it's a guy I met on a bus. <laughs> now, that said, it was a bus at a conference with another conference attendee. So it's qualified. But the point being, leads, leads can come from literally any, anywhere along the way. They can be very highly qualified people you've known for a while with Nest. I had known Tony Fidel for many years, and then when he left Apple and he started something new, it was a relationship that was well, already there that led into it. So it can be, Yeah. go ahead. Are there certain things that are, I mean, you hear the adage that you guys get inundated with proposals, right? And there's no way you can physically process all of these proposals that are coming into you. Are there certain things that, you know, one, you would just not even look at, certain, certain pattern recognition, are there certain things that really pique your interest? And I think you mentioned one of them was, you know, it's somebody you know who's a serial entrepreneur who has a track record. That, at least, you know, in my experience, that is almost probably the number one uh, risk mitigation factor for, for VCs. I, I think the serial entrepreneur can be, mm -hmm. but at the same time, that's not always true. You look at some of the, the biggest, most interesting companies, they are actually first-time entrepreneurs. And, Obviously, Facebook and Airbnb are right at the right at the top of that list. So, go, go ahead. I mean, even going back though, you know, Apple, Microsoft, they're, they're all like that. Um, so, Rob, with maybe your your bus experience as an exception, have you ever funded anyone that can't, came in unqualified, kind of straight cold email, or uh, you know, walked up to you at a conference? That's very unusual. That that would be really unusual, and I would imagine it's the same for the other people on the panel. But I'd say in any given day, there's probably this will sound wild, but 15 new investment proposals that come in one way or another. I think that's probably, yeah. 
Yeah. Just, yeah. just to give you an Easily. idea of the scale. I, and I think, you know, a number of folks have written blog posts and different articles about this, but um, it's, it's pretty consistent that a warm intro, my, my partner David Hornick has written a number of them. Uh, a warm intro, it, it sounds, you know, sounds unnecessary. It's a, a very intelligent thing to do, to, to figure out a way to, and then part of it is, can you, are you, um, you know, Compelling enough and 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 thoughtful enough to figure out a way to get a a, a warm into an intro to a guy like Rob, like you know, and it, it it shows some ingenuity. Yeah, we we did we funded one. It's now a public company actually. Oh good. Okay. Um, but the, the reason the reason that it's it's literally the only one we've ever funded I think that came in uh, literally through our website and this was seven years ago. Um, and uh, the reason that we got interested and were able to move on it is because we'd been studying the space. So it was something that was kind of qualified because we knew we wanted to make a bet, or we thought we wanted to make a bet if we found the right company. Mm -hmm. And and the kind of pattern matching about that space came into into focus, and we moved quickly and got the deal done. Um, it ended up being competitive because they probably submitted to 20 other firms as well. Right. Um, but uh, by far and away, I have nothing more to add on the relationship side. It's yeah. it's a, it's a lot of selection bias uh, that that gets you into a good firm. And, and I don't think people in the room should, should take a pessimistic you know, conclusion from this because you know, it's really all about persistence and, as Tripp said, finding a way to get to the right investor. And right now there are more avenues than ever, especially at the seed level, where you can pick up some funding and get some traction and begin to get some attention. Um, I represent, I've represented Airbnb since the day they were incorporated and they came into my office. They weren't funded. And um, I love the model um, and tried to help them get funded and provided them with a number of introductions to investors and uh, mainly VC investors. And you know, they, they got a number of rejections, uh, but they were undeterred and they continued to plow ahead. And, and I think you know, their experience is sort of one you should sort of take to heart. I think it's, it's the right message for any entrepreneur is just to continue to, to, to move forward. As a side note, I think I've sent five business plans to Rob over the years, and he's rejected me every time. So <laughs> <laughs> the war intro doesn't always work either. I think I said thank you every yeah, time. Yeah, he, he was yeah. very polite about it. <laughs> um, one thing we're seeing more and more of are these unicorn rounds, these massive, um, sometimes called private IPOs. And so it's a new strata where as Steve said, these companies would be public if it were in a different era. Um, massive revenue, massive uh, uh, scale, uh, huge amounts of capital raised. Um, what do you think is going to happen to this class of companies? And I think, you know, twofold, their valuation is very high. And two, the, a lot of the founders who are very young entrepreneurs have a sort of a disdain for going public. They don't want to go public. I, what, what is going to happen to this class of you know, the Ubers, the Airbnbs, the Lyfts, and you know, Cloud, Cloudera is the other, you know, the big unicorns? What, what do you think? How does this story end? If they can, they'll all go public eventually. I mean, Facebook didn't want to go public. And, well, you they know, had to for regulatory yeah, reasons. Yeah, but like, I mean, it, it doesn't, I mean, it, 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 you know, it's something that you think about before you take capital is if, if you're going to take professional money, there has to be a liquidity event at some point. And it's, it's something, it, it, it sounds so simple, but like it's something, it's a kind of a, a promise. And, and the, the good news is that, you know, we're going to be really patient and it could take five years, it could take 10 years, it could take 15 years. And, and, you know, a couple of our best exits recently, Ebates and Splunk, were both north of 10 year investments. Um, but at, at, you know, at the end, you know, there has to be some sort of exit. And, and with those companies, the only natural exit is, is to go public. It's not like HomeAway is going to buy an Airbnb. Um, it just doesn't work like that. So Rob? Well, I think what will happen is there's a phrase that people haven't heard for a while. It's called the living dead. <laughs> How many people are familiar with the living dead? Raise your hand. In the venture context? OK. The living dead is a company that it's basically generating sufficient cash flow that it keeps going, but there's not a lot of growth. So it just keeps going, and it's around. And none of us will mention the ones in our portfolio, but <laughs> all three of us have, I'm sure. 
except August, um, companies in their portfolio that have been around for a while. They've been around for a decade. And I th actually think what's going to happen with a lot of these unicorns is people will get excited about, for whatever reason, there will be schadenfreude. Is that how you pronounce it, schadenfreude? Um, you know, this excitement about the ones that don't work out. There will be plenty that work out. But I actually think that over half of them, they're going to fall into this category we just don't hear a lot about them. Mm -hmm. You know, it just kind of drops off the news. They're there. Talk to people that work there. How's it going? They're like, yeah, it's, it's going pretty well. <laughs> and that's what you're going to see. And it's not going to be exciting. And it's not this great headline of, you know, XYZ VC says, you know, we're going to see a lot of deaths. But basically, you're going to see a lot of zombies. That's what you're yeah. likely to see out of that, yeah. that class of companies would be my prediction. Yeah, so of, of, of those, let's say, out of the class of Airbnb, Uber, WeWork, Lyft, Snapchat, of those, what would your advice be to the founders at this point? Now, in, in your defense, you don't know everything that's going on with these companies, but these are all unicorns. Well, you just pick the best ones, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, but would you I don't sell, know. I mean, they keep would you doing know what you're doing. Of, stuff you sell, that I don't know. Would you go public now? Would you continue on the current path? Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, but at some point with those companies, I'm going to kind of weasel out of this a little bit. You reach a point, and you're the attorney, so you know that there's so many people that you have as shareholders where you effectively become a public right. company, you right. kind of have to go. Right. So you just, you look at the liability of not going public is my sense of what happens for the ones that are at the short end of the tail that are incredibly valuable. It's really the ones in between that I think will be in the, the, the purgatory of, of the living dead, mm -hmm. more than people think. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, th those are tough examples. I'd, be, you know, <laughs> I'd r tell them to raise as much money as they you know, can right now, make their balance sheets impenetrable, and go public when they want to. I mean, that's, that, that's the play. You know, that's yeah. what they're, yeah. they're afforded. Uh, but eventually, yeah, they have, they've got to do something. Yeah. Now, all, all you got, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I'll keep it short. I would say no. keep growing, but try to find some profit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't be on this panel. Yeah. I can go Profit? Now. <laughs> What's that? Um, and that doesn't refer to those companies specifically, just right. so I don't eat my entire foot. Um, you guys all obviously sit on boards. You manage founders. You work with founders. It would, I think it would be really instructive to describe to the, to the group here, wh what is it like serving on a board and working with founders? I and mean, what are some of the issues that you come across that are challenging? What is, wh what is it like? This is all confidential. Anyway, yeah, no, so I, I, I can tell with that little box <laughs> with the window and the red light there. Did that you it's, sign your consent, Rob? I, I actually think that it's a lot like going on a road trip. That's what I would say. It's, what do you it's, mean by that? Well, you're sitting in the right front seat, which statistically, by the way, is the death seat. <laughs> <laughs> it's the one where you die. It is, because you know, like in your subconscious when you're driving the car, and you have like that split second decision, and you've, you've messed up, and you're about to hit something, it's not going to be you, right? <laughs> so, so let's put that aside for a minute. Think about a road trip. You go on a long road trip somewhere. Who do you want to have on that, that side? Do you want somebody that's going to be giving you feedback on how you drive the whole way? Probably not. Do you want somebody that uh, is going to help you with the radio? Yeah, you probably want somebody that's going to help you with the radio. Somebody that is going to help you think about, hey, are we going to drive all the way to New Orleans, or are we going to stop in Albuquerque? You know, those types of decisions. Or, hey, I need help finding the bathroom. Or should I pick up that hitchhiker, or things like that. The, the entrepreneur doesn't want somebody that is giving them feedback on, hey, you know, the car is kind of jerky, or stay in your lane, or right. you're awfully close to that truck. Mm -hmm. So as an investor, what you're really thinking about is when you're invited on the road trip, mm -hmm. do you want to get in the car? And you start to think about these things in advance. So I really think it's much more of a, a coaching and counseling type role, because you mentioned managing. And it's, it's, not a, it's not a managing role. It's, it's really more of a companion on that trip riding shotgun mm -hmm. than it is anything else, in, in my opinion. I, I think when you look at the, the, the great investors, you see that's absolutely the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To you know, further your analogy, it's, it's, um, you have to also recognize that 
if this is going to be a successful road trip, it's going to be a long road trip. And there's a level of commitment involved in both sides. And you should have that, you know, eyes wide open going into it that, you know, next to, you know, your significant other, this in, in, in your family, this is, you know, a very serious relationship in your life. And, and to pretend it's not, you know, it, it's not factual, especially in the Series A and Series B rounds. I'd, I'd emphasize that relationship point. It's been likened to marriage before. You, you do get legally bound to your investor, um, and, and hopefully uh, he or she is a good spouse. Um, occasionally that doesn't happen. So uh, I, I think it is a hallmark of a good investor that, uh, that articulates like Rob does on, on a lot of this and Trip does. But um, occasionally the, the passengers will get, and it turns into a bus instead of a car, and then they mutiny. Um, and, uh, and that can be quite unpleasant for everybody involved um, when those things do happen. And, you know, we don't like to talk about them, but it happens. Um, failing gracefully as, as a venture investor and or an entrepreneur is, is, uh, is highly valued and it's a small world. So these things come around on both sides. Mm -hmm. And just one last thing to add, because I know a lot of, you know, a lot of folks here are thinking about becoming entrepreneurs. You know, before you take money from from anyone, especially kind of a, even you know, if, you know, a high profile venture fund, actually figure out you know, do the diligence on on the investor. Like, you know, we expect you, you know, we expect you to actually reference check us, and make sure you know we are who we say we are because it's it's super important, and you don't want to you don't want to be on you know a bad road trip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Um that's why I hear over and over again that the, one of the most important factors is who is, the, who is the founder, who's the entrepreneur, because it's really, I think most, you know, almost all good VCs believe that when they invest in a company, it's the entrepreneur's company. They're not, this isn't like getting into a relationship where you think you can fix the other person. This, this is a situation where you really want to have somebody, and I, I've seen deals, I'm sure you guys have come across uh, companies that have been fantastic uh, in terms of their growth and their metrics, but there's issues with the team. And the better part of discretion is to, to not go forward with the deal. So. Yes. <laughs> I was hoping to get some sort of a no, story I mean, I think it, I mean, I think with all of us, I mean, I'm assuming, in, but, you know, it starts and ends with the entrepreneur. Yeah. It's, you know, percentages are overused and not that, you know, helpful. But, you know, it's 75% of the, the investment, especially early. It early, you know, the earlier it is, the more it is. And, you know, it, it, you know that's, that's the bad. And if no matter how great the idea is or how good the early traction or whatever it is, if the entrepreneur is not, you know, if it's just a B, we're not going to do it. Yeah. yeah. So, so one of the things people think about when they're entrepreneurs and they hear this advice, because it's absolutely true. It is absolutely the number one thing that investors, professional investors think about is, quote, quality of team. So you say, well, how do I, how do I convince people that I'm good? Like, how do they know how good I am? You know, did I go to, did I go to Haas? Did I go to Stanford? Did I go to Wharton? Or, um, you know, did I work at Airbnb for a while? Or did I work at some startup people haven't heard of? What's really important beyond that initial introduction you get is when you present your company, you should think about the great investors will evaluate you through the lens of how you talk about the product, how you talk about the market, and the work that you have done to build the business. That's what they'll truly think about, and that's where your abilities really shine through. And when I think about the entrepreneurs that we've backed where we feel great, versus the ones that we've backed that had gold-plated resumes that didn't work out as well. What you go back to is, you, for, for us anyways, you really think about that product. Do they come in and is the first thing that the entrepreneur is excited to tell you about is this is the product that I'm building, have built, and she's explaining the market and why it solves that problem. And you just see that product solution passion that's there. Because if that's not there, then all these other things don't matter. And I, for us, when we think about how people talk about products, their understanding of the consumer, their understanding of the market, that's the lens that we use to understand the person and the fit. It's far more important than anything else because there's no other way you could evaluate somebody that's fresh out of school and has a really great idea how to set them apart from somebody that has 20 years of experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the authenticity and the passion in a great entrepreneur comes through very clearly. 
and you know you can tell the people that kind of live their companies and and those are the type of folks that we're looking for yeah that's that's absolutely golden advice um, and and heartening too that that actually the presentation and the interaction is huge when you're presenting and uh, well it, it's funny because people go and they put together a marketing plan and they talk about focus groups and this and that but when I spent a lot of time focused on connected hardware companies. And the companies I find that work really well when they're designing a product that nobody's touched, they've actually gone out and they've looked at how consumers use existing products before they do any design. They're actually really focused on understanding the customer before they do it. So you have to have that long before you actually design the product or even think about testing the product. And the way in which people do this, again, it's the lens through which we really understand entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you each have sort of a particular focus. Rob, it's hardware. You know, A, for you, it's clean tech, connected, and trip. You're in consumer um, platform. In your areas, what are, what are some of the, it doesn't have to be the companies, but some of the specific technologies that have you really excited? What are, the, what are the things that you think are going to be the next billion dollar companies? What are the areas? I mean, the, the one that I've been spending most of my time in is uh, marketplace lending. I have a marketplace, marketplace lending. Marketplace lending, yes. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple investments in this space. And, and frankly, looking back, uh, looking back at it, um, we should have invested in a whole lot more. Um, when we had a chance. Uh, the two in the space that we were invested in early were Avant, which is in Chicago, which is a near prime online lender, and Common Bond, which I hope a few of you use or, or, or you know, in the future will use, which is a, uh, it's a, super, it's a young super prime uh, marketplace lender for uh, the consolidation of student, uh, of student loans as well as primary loans while you're still in school. And the reason why we're excited about it is it's twofold. Um, it, the, the first is the internet allows you know, these companies to acquire customers in, in, in a manner like so much more efficient than anything you know, in traditional financial services. You know, where yeah. acquiring a customer, if you, know, if you amortize out the cost of your bank branch and you know, all your infrastructure and your loan officers, you know, it, it would cost thousands and thousands of dollars to actually you know, underwrite a loan for someone you know, we can now do it for a couple hundred dollars, you know, including the customer acquisition costs, which, which allow a few things. One is it allows you, you know, us to make you a $5,000 loan instead of a $50,000 loan. If, you know, I always challenge people to like walk into a bank and try to get a $5,000 loan. It's really, really difficult, you know, unless you have, you know, $10,000 in the bank, they're probably not interested in doing business with you. Um, and the second one is, um, is, is the, you know, the, the, We've, for a long time, and, and it's very applicable to a lot of people in this room, we have been uh, misunderwriting folks. We, we rely on FICO scores pr predominantly, <clears throat> FICO rewards, uh, stability in, in employment, stability in your home, and, and, and it doesn't understand your assets or your earning potential. And there's a lot of different ways, and, and that's just not really applicable. If really high-performing folks you know, they go to a great undergraduate university, then they move somewhere interesting, you know, and work for, you know, for a job for a year or two. Then they move somewhere else interesting and work for a job for a year or two. Then they go back to school or go to a third job. From a FICO perspective, like, you're awful credit. You know, most of the people in this room are awful credit, you know, from, from a FICO perspective, but we all know differently than that. You know, you know, and there's ways that you can use kind of, you know, alternative data sources and you can't use everything, that's one thing. Everyone, like, like, I'll pull all the social data. You actually can't legally use that. But if, if you actually look at, you know, if you can underwrite the person instead of their FICO score, there's a massive opportunity. And that's, you know, it, it, that's especially what we're trying to do at Common Bond and Avant. So uh, that's what gets me excited. I could go on because I am excited about it. Robots. <laughs> Ro robots. No, I mean, I, I, I say that, I, I, I drop that there, but I mean, if you look at self-driving cars, those are robots. You take a look at anything that senses its environment, it takes independent action after doing some sort of analysis. That could be a Nest thermostat, for example. Robotics are pervading every part of our lives. We see it with drones, we see it in a lot of areas. 
And what's, what's happening under the covers there from a technology perspective, because Sam, you're asking about technologies that are interesting, is there are multiple Moore's Law driven technologies that underpin robotics. So you have the processing power, you have just memory and storage, you have the sensors that you use for machine vision, you have the actuators and the control loop chips that you use to control those actuators. You have all these areas, say five or six major veins of technology proce progress that are coming together at once for one functional unit. And what that means in practice is that the effectiveness of a unit of robotic power, so to speak, is not advancing at the speed of Moore's Law. It's actually advancing far faster than Moore's Law. And I think a, a lot of people miss this when you take a look at the space right now. So that's one area. And to simplify it, part of what's happening, and you see this with Qualcomm and others, they have built all these silicon technologies and camera technologies and memory technologies that, and bandwidth, obviously, that are optimized for these devices, but now you can take these things because they become so commoditized and you can apply them in new ways. So that's one area. Another area which I think is gotten a lot of hype, but it's deserved probably in the medium term, not quite the short term, but the medium term is VR. How, how many people in here have tried on a VR headset? Okay, a lot of people. And then how many people haven't? I just want to see for contrast. Okay. Um, are you guys really, no, really entrepreneurs? I mean, you really got to go out and try this stuff. If you're thinking about anything in tech, it's something that's well worth trying because these technologies are so close at hand and to, I think, mainstream adoption. So those are the two areas that I spent a lot of time in. And I'm very interested in, yeah. Yeah, so I, our kind of broadest definition of this, and I'll dive into a couple examples, is any technology-enabled business or service that touches energy and resources, and that's fairly broadly defined. So um, Rob and I work together on a company that is actually in kind of an urbanization theme overall. The world is urbanizing. People are moving to urban centers. Population density is getting greater. How do you feed them? How do you move them around? So anything that's technology-enabled that fits that broad category we're very interested in. Um, some ag tech, actually, investments. So there's a lot of drone activity in this particular area, actually. Surveying fields, using data collection and analysis to better grow crops, um, GPS-guided tractors, uh, and all of the data that comes off of those. There's fascinating stuff going on in the ag world. Um, another big piece on the energy side is actually also similar uh, to what has been said, financing platforms, actually. So one of the, the, the big beasts in the, in the kind of uh, venture-funded Energy World is a company called Solar City. It does many things, but really, if you distill what their model is and what they're being paid for, it's actually they're financing an esoteric asset, which in this case is consumer-driven cash flows off of a solar system. Um, and they were kind of the first to market to actually have that insight and drive a consumer product and service that people wanted by using a financing mechanism. I'm on another, a board of another company that um, is growing massively called Renovate America that has another financing platform uh, that is using contractors to finance uh, home energy retrofits and services. Um, and and they're, they're exploding because they've kind of hit this product market fit on, uh, on, on the contractor market. So anything with these kind of broad themes that uh, these are all technology and services businesses, but they fit into kind of that energy and resource story for our particular fund. Very, very cool. Um, so now with the yin, there's the yang. What, what areas do you think are just, you know, dead? And uh, either overhyped or, or just <clears throat> completely not interested in? Oh, it's not that hard. I, I got to shoot first <laughs> because uh, you know, I've, I've been about 12 years in clean tech, and there have been a lot of dead bodies in my world. Um, so uh, I think the, the areas that have been... Um, from a capital perspective as well as an ongoing interest area perspective that have been underserved and will continue to be, um, are venture dollars typically going into kind of hardcore materials innovation. It's fascinating stuff. We need it for the world. It's not a great fit for the venture model unless you know exactly what your target is. It's very difficult. And as a result, um, a lot of dollars went in, a lot of dollars didn't come out. Um, some, some good companies are getting starved as a result, to be honest. 
Um, but uh, that area is just completely dead, and that's an area close to home for us. So uh, I've had the same observation. What's the way, how do we, you know, because we actually need these things. How do we fund them? I don't have a good answer for that, actually. It's, it's, it's a disappointing, it's a disappointing um, answer. What? There's a lot of government activity it, it, going on. There's a lot of SBIR stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of early stage stuff, but crossing that chasm from early to real. My, my, own, like, my observation is the only way to fund it is through government funding. To like you know, because it takes ten to twenty years, it's super capital intensive, and y you don't really know what the end of the tunnel is. Yeah, and there's an observation as well on you know we love the mobile world. A lot of it is GPS enabled. That's our government. I mean, they set up. We we all take it for granted that we're using the data coming off of these satellites on a daily basis and a minute to minute basis for technology enabled services that are local. That was funded by, by our government. And so that, that kind of applica or the infrastructure layer is not a good place for venture dollars, but it's a great place for somebody to put dollars in. Mm -hmm. The only comment that I would make is I've, I'm racking my brain on like what won't work. And having done this for a long time, the one thing that I've stopped doing is looking at things and saying that won't work because I've been wrong so many times. Well, I mean, I so, <laughs> so what I think about, now what I will say, I'll, I'll, I'll offer up one area. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go out and uh, build a company to build high-speed rail right now, <laughs> mainly, because, you know, the, mainly because if you take a look at self-driving cars, you should be able to just go down the right-of-way of I-5, for example, build an extra four lanes, and if you have dedicated cars that can run at about 200 miles an hour, those exist. They're built in Germany. It's a place called the Audubon. Uh, you should be able to deliver something that is far superior to high-speed rail. So I think there's some things you can look at like that. But so many areas, the rules get broken over and over. What about like so messaging? You like, look. Yeah. Food delivery and messaging. <laughs> we, yeah, we, already just, we already said that. But that's for today, until they get unpopular again. And, then and, and people would have said that four years ago, too, probably, right? And people would say that eight years ago. But I think really. Space after space after space. It's kind of a dangerous game to say yeah. what's not going to what's not going to work because entrepreneurs prove areas you know to be ripe for innovation time and time True. again. Rob gets my next five materials deals. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been told we're running short on time. I, I, I want to give the audience just a couple minutes to ask three questions if people are are brave enough. Um, so right here, Andre, right in front, right there. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for this. I have, uh, my name is Nan Liu and I'm from LETV Strategy Investor. So I have a question. Uh, uh, do you ever take on, you know, uh, companies who founders are, uh, you know, like the whole company was from another country, like Europe, Russia, like, you know, and then they come to Silicon Valley to set up their U.S. office, like U.S. headquarters and start, you know, are you, do you guys ever invest in those type of companies? Uh, all the time. Yeah, I mean, it, proximity matters. And I, you know, I, I, even though I, most of the deals, frankly, most of the deals I've done in the last three years have been outside of California, um, sort of bucking the, the the trends, partly because of valuation reasons. Um, but a lot of the a lot of the companies that we fund have recently moved to the valley. Maybe they could raise seed, you know, seed funding in Australia or Sweden or wherever, and we, you know, they move to Palo Alto and we fund them. I'm, from, I'm Mary. Um, I'll tell you where I'm from later. But uh, this question is for a trip. So it sounds like you're pretty pessimistic on the food delivery startups. Um, so no thoughts on that? I, I, I have an idea of why, but just like general thoughts on that and advice to the founders. I mean, <laughs> Did so, everyone get the question? So, so why am I pessimistic on food delivery? W one is that there's so much capital chasing it right now, <laughs> uh, especially in the Bay Area. I, I, I mean, it's a. Uh, Every time I order something, I love, from a service perspective, I love it. You know, it's, they're great consumer services. Uh, and every time I order something, I always think about the, you know, the, the VC fund that's subsidizing my meal. And it kind of like makes me smile a little bit. Um, <laughs> part of it, you know, part of it, I, I don't know, you know, I, I'm a little, I'm overall skeptical on of the on-demand economy. We, we obviously have Uber, which we hold up, and it's a great, great business. Uh, but everyone kind of thinks there'll be an Uber for an Uber for something, you know, X, Y, and Z. 
And I, it's tough to be efficient. And, and I, I have long-term questions on the unit economics. I think companies like Seamless Grubhub, that's a good company. They, they acquire customers, they provide choice, and they, they bring the, those customers to, to restaurants you know, that are looking for these folks, and they take a nice cut of it. Uh, and it's, there's a reason why it's a multi-billion dollar public company. You know, these folks that are you know, kind of offering the full stack delivery experience, um, I'm just a lot more bearish on, even though you know, we have one. Hi, uh, my name is Louis, I come from France. I have a question about your uh, LPs. I was wondering who, who they were and what was the maturity of your funds, like how much flexibility do you have in giving back money to them? Well, I think in general, people don't talk explicitly about their, their, their limited partners. And a big part of it is like the limited partners are interested in that privacy. Uh, but putting that aside, big picture, uh, across the group of, of three of us, I think if I was, I was to say family offices, you have endowments of major universities, you have public pension funds, you have corporate pension funds. And then the other big groups are what are called fund of funds, where they aggregate capital from uh, family offices that aren't huge but are still wealthy, and then they invest in funds, and then the final would be uh, sovereign wealth funds. Mm -hmm. And yes, they're interested in more than their money back. <laughs> yeah, and that's our job. That's what we look to do is to deliver the strongest possible returns we can for those limited partners. Mm -hmm. On the contract, is it a 10 year, 15 year, 20 year uh, deal, like enough by average? Typically, it's 10 to 12 years, and then there are standard extensions that are there. Uh, so think of the lifespan. When they go in they're, at the beginning, they're thinking of it as a, really a 12 to 15 year commitment. What does happen is you will have LPs that partway through may sell secondaries, so they might sell their position to another LP. You know, 10 years sounds like a long time, it, but you know, just in our, our last few funds, so much of the returns were generated in companies in their 11th and 12th years. I mean, it made, you know, from, from okay funds to great funds with those years, um, it, which is, you know, not, not intuitive. Hey, uh, my name is Nate. I'm from here at Berkeley. Uh, my question concerns uh, what you guys mentioned earlier about the uh, living debt. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, what I'm actually really interested in is in terms of for a, har a hardware company, uh, what are the characteristics of a hardware company's product to that uh, a successful company might avoid becoming living dead, the living dead? Well, I, I think you need to have something that grows. I mean, fundamentally, you need to have something where you have growing revenue. So you have products that are either delivering increasing revenue once they're out in the field. So you've got a software piece that's attached to it, or you have a next generation of products. So, the hardware companies that avoid that, they tend to invest in R&D properly so that subsequent products get better and better and you have upgrades. And another model is you buy something you put into your home and you like it so much, like the first Sonos speaker you get, you get the second speaker, you're like, ooh, that was great. And then you have two and you're like, wow, they sound great in stereo. So instead of buying one more for my kitchen, I'm gonna buy two more for my kitchen. So. Those are some of the strategies you have to have, but it, it's always growth and investment in product for hardware companies. And, and a lot of companies will pivot too, like the, the flip, flip camera, didn't they start out as sort of a, almost sort of like a photographic, a self-photographic. a disposable digital yeah, camera. Yeah, disposable digital camera, and then they sort of changed into this video camera and were acquired by Cisco, I think like 10 or 12 years later. So pivoting is also part of the equation. where in a home you might only have one net in, in a home. And so the likelihood that you're going to get another net in your home is, is I, I would assume, very low. So in a, in, a, in a situation like that, what does a product that avoids coming with a net look like? Where well, yeah, it, I, if, if, if for anybody that's interested in this, I, I gave a talk at the Solid Conference back in July. So if you just Google and you look at Google my name and you look at videos, there's a Solid talk I gave on this. And there are different strategies you can use to grow these companies. So for somebody like Nest, I think of it as a land and expand category, which is you get that initial foothold and then you offer adjacent products or services. So for Nest, it's you go in, you buy the thermostat, then you buy the smoke alarms, then you have, there are services and things that you can do on that. That's the type of thing. 
Why don't we do uh, one last question? Thank you. Uh, my name is Stuart Noyce, and I'm a Haas MBA. And recently, I went uh, from the internet computing space into uh, genomics. One thing I'd noticed uh, from the panel was that there was no mention of genomics, and there's been any huge, uh, you know, a, a body of work over the last 10, 15 years that's gone into this space. And I'm wondering what your th what your thoughts are on this area. I mean, there's a there's an amazing amount of of opportunity in genomics, and I don't think I'm smart enough to to invest in it. <laughs> I mean, and, and I say that tongue in cheek, but I sort of mean it too. Well, I, I mean, very quickly, the industry has evolved increasingly to one of specialization and to find and get into the most interesting opportunities in a specific field, you really need to go deep in that field and have background. And I think it's interesting. I think there's a lot of great opportunities there, but it's not something that I'm well suited to evaluate or other people in my firm are well suited to evaluate, but it's not judgment on whether we think it's a good category or not. Ditto. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I want to thank our panelists for coming all the way out to Berkeley. Great panel. Thank you, guys.